welcome back to another video on the channel. This is another one of my personal videos today, and we're going to be talking about webtoons. In specific, we're going to cover a little bit on the history of webtoons. We're going to talk about how to read webtoons in the US, what your options are, where you can go. We're going to talk about some webtoon adaptions that are quite popular in different mediums. And we're going to talk about some basic recommendations, some works of reference, a few common types of stories that are shown in webtoons. That's all going to be based on my own prerogative and what I've read and what I enjoy. So let's get started with the history of webtoons. What are webtoons? Now I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will have heard of webtoons or webcomics. And if you've read them, you probably know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you're probably picturing something like an online comic strip or something short and funny, kind of like what you would find in Sunday Comics or posted to Twitter by a comic making group. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. So webtoons are a form of Korean online publications. Sometimes they're unique stories, sometimes they're adapting web novels or manhwa. Some of you may know what web novels or manhwa are, but they're other types of Asian literature. Specifically, many webtoons do adapt web novels, which is a very large industry in many Asian countries. As an interesting tidbit, currently the Korean webtoon industry is about as powerful as the in paper industry. They're about equally popular and they're published in similar ways, which is interesting. So one of the characteristics of Webtoon, which has evolved from the original Webtoon to the Webtoons we have today, are the format that they are presented in. So they are predominantly presented online, although you can sometimes find collected volumes of all the chapters or a particular season, since in Webtoons they call each set of like a year's worth or the first arc of a series is called a season, and often there are breaks between seasons to give the artist and or author a break. So the particular format has changed. So there was a first stage of webtoons, which was essentially just comics posted to online websites. You could click through them so you had an interactive experience like you were changing pages. In the second generation of Webtoon, they introduced scrolling features, and this is when you start to get a lot of characteristics of Webtoons. In the third generation, this is what we're currently in, and this is what defines Webtoons these days, is a constantly scrolling format where the art and the text bubbles and such are specifically designed to maximize the ability of the scrolling function. So often, you can scroll through a scene for several movements of your hand and the image itself does not end. It is one long continuous picture. In third generation and possibly in second, although I have no examples to confirm this, there is also the incorporation of music associated with chapters, especially in many of the apps that you can read these off of, which we're going to cover in a second, where it will request access to your speakers because it will play specific songs and music tracks as you're reading at certain points in the story. And there's also the presence of moving image items, such as if you're scrolling down an image and you're looking at two characters and there are cherry blossoms falling, some manga, some webtoon authors will have those cherry blossoms animated. While the characters aren't animated, the blossoms are giving there an extra dimension to this particular type of media. Much like web novels in Asia and manhwa, most of which release online at first before they are sent to print, and some of which release primarily online, they are released in a chapter by chapter format in which the author publishes one two or three chapters a week, or maybe one chapter a month, or one chapter every few weeks. And each chapter is approximately somewhere between three and 10 to 12 pages. Now, these are usually pay by episode or wait for episode models in which you can read them. This means that some creators will make it so that you can read the first three or four chapters of their work for free. And then past that, you have to either pay for them by chapter or use whatever purchase method that the site they're hosted on deems appropriate, whether that be a specific type of coin that you pay for or something else. 
Now, there's also the wait time model in which every week or every so so many days, a chapter will become available for free. However, this usually is about three chapters behind where the people who pay for the content are reading from. So you're always a little behind the immediate releases. For example, I'm currently reading a few webtoons. I do not pay for them. Instead, I wait for them to come out, which means that I am three to four chapters behind the current release schedule. Most places that have a wait time model also have a pay by episode model. So you can then use coins or real money to pay for more chapters. A lot of places also have coins as something that you can earn by reading a certain amount of works. Webtoons also have a massive and growing LGBTQ presence. Many creators are LGBTQ plus and many are writing about LGBTQ plus characters, topics and events. In a lot of places in the West, many of these apps that were created in Asia for Asian webtoons have also become the home for many non-Asian creators. Dom and Neighbor Webtoon launched in 2003 and 2004, and they are both home to many webtoons and webcomics created by Asian creators, American creators, and creators from all over the world and from all walks of life. Webtoons caught on quite quickly in China, India, and even here in the United States. However, in Japan, they did not catch on as quickly due to the massive manga industry there. China and Korea do not have as large a manga industry as Japan does. In fact, China and Korea have a stronger web novel community. And webtoons, since they often adapt web novels, are therefore just as popular as web novels. So the simplest ways to read webtoons in the US are through the legal services. Some of these are Naver Webtoon, Manta, Tapas, Tapitoon, Mangatoon, Legend Comics, Tomix, Webcomics, Spatoon, Tori Comics, Chayo Comics, and some other sites are available. Now, those are some of the biggest sites, and a lot of those have apps. On my phone, personally, I have at least nine of those downloaded. Each one typically has a slightly different catalog, different creators producing works on their websites, and different stories available. There is also a large and growing community of people who post either the raws or translated raws into illegal manga pirating websites. Most of these people attain the copies by paying for the initial chapter release and then they take what they call the raws or the original Korean, Chinese, or Japanese pages and then they either run it through an online translator or they have teams of people such as proofreaders, typesetters, type cleaners, and obtainers, and discord servers, where they basically run this like an online business. This is, of course, highly illegal, and many creators now post warnings at the top of their works in many of these apps, and one of the reasons why I was not able to obtain a lot of images and footage for this are because most of these apps now block screenshots and screen recording capabilities from occurring inside of the app interfaces. Unfortunately, even for still shots, it's dangerous to use. And honestly, I could very be easily be taken down for copyright for using too many still images, especially if the typing is included in the thought bubbles. However, many creators on YouTube are able to get away by pulling some of the images off of a Google image search and then erasing the writing out of the word bubbles. Most of the services that I have listed have the presence of both pay to read and wait for reading models. However, certain creators can make sure that their works cannot be on wait time models. I've run into that myself in the past and then it becomes how much you want to read it. Like in any industry, there is a prohibitive price towards those who can't afford it. Unfortunately, this is common in the regular manga and book industry as well. Mangas are very expensive, often series are very long, and when you consider the cost, it can be prohibitively expensive for you to collect them in paper. So there are, there's a growing movement of adaptions being made from many popular webtoons that have ended or are close to ending and such. There's a couple very famous film ones, such as Taza and Relife. Relife, I recently watched for 
one of our videos on the channel. And I did end up going and reading it. It is Japanese in creation, but it was originally published in a webtoon format before it was collected into 15 Tanbakan volumes and released as a manga. Now, some TV adaptions, mostly in the form of J-dramas, K-dramas and C-dramas, are Orange Marmalade, The Great Catsby, Itaewon Class, True Beauty, and My Roommate is a Gumiho. Some of these are available on Netflix for us to watch here in the US. In terms of games, there are games based on Tower of God, God of High School, No Bless, and a solo leveling game coming out later this year, hopefully. I am a rabid fan of solo leveling. I think it's one of the best webtoons and books in general that I've ever read. I highly recommend it. So I'm very excited for that game to come out. In terms of anime, Noblesse has an anime, as does Real Life. Nanbaka, How to Keep a Mummy, The God of High School, Tower of God, and Noblesse. Now you'll notice God of High School, Tower of God, and Noblesse keep coming up. I've mentioned them several times. This is because that these are generally regarded as three of the most popular webtoons of the last decade. They attained massive fame and were very long series as each of them and maintained their popularity throughout their run. All three have since ended. There are a few more webtoons that have been adapted into ONAs or original net animations, which are usually shorter than true anime series is, and they're a little less produced budget wise. Let's Play, My Giant Nerd Boyfriend, and Noblesse Awakening, which is a spin off of Noblesse. So, despite the fact that this is primarily a Korean online form of literature. There are many adaptions. So there's a couple common types of webtoons or tropes and works of interest. And a lot of these types come down to types of stories that are popular in South Korea. One of the most popular ones is a gamer styled power fantasy. These are typically categorized by webtoons where either the main character or the entire cast are able to interact with a game-like interface in real life where they can level up their stats and they can get abilities and improve them and such and heal themselves almost as if they were playing a MMORPG in virtual reality. However, it is happening to them in real life. Some of these include The Gamer, Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint, Solo Leveling, Tomb Raider King, Kill the Hero, and Second Life Ranker. There are many, many more of these, especially after su the success of The Gamer and Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint, which are two of the current most popular webtoons. Solo Leveling has incidentally just ended its run as well, so there have been a lot of shows hoping to pick up in that absence. Another popular type of webtoon in the West are Hades and Persephone, or tell retellings of pantheons and mythology. Here there are two very famous examples, both of which have English books released, and one of which has a fair amount of merchandise at Hot Topic. This would be Lore Olympus and Punderworld. Both of these examples I have read personally, and they are both Hades and Persephone myth retellings. Lore Olympus gained a lot of popularity when it first came out due to its unique art style and its modern take on Greek mythology while preserving a lot of the stories. Another common thing in webtoons is series that concern themselves with death in some way. Soul Food, Plague Muffins, Loving Reaper, Home Sweet Ghosts, My Reaper Boyfriend. All of these shows either have to do with the presence of the Reaper and or death as a major character or what happens after death. There are also some interesting webtoons for Western culture, such as Batman the Wayne Family Adventures, which is an official DC Comics publication. It is licensed by DC Comics, and therefore it can be considered part of the DC Comic continuity. Now, Batman Wayne Family Adventures is interesting in that it is essentially about Batman and all of his various sidekicks living together. It's not anything like any other comic I've ever seen from DC, and it's done completely in webtoon style. It's very interesting to read. 
there's also a massive growing LGBTQ space in Webtoons because many apps such as Naver and the others, but especially Naver Webtoon, allow for what they call canvas creators, creators who are not doing this for profit at first, but they can be picked up for profit later. These people are at first just producing these comics for their own achievement or just to publish an idea that they've had. I personally have read several series that were originally debuted in the Canvas space that then were later picked up by publishing companies and moved over to the official publications areas. Some of these include Boyfriends, High Class Homos, Banana Milkshake, Be My Villain, To the Stars and Back, and Small World. There's often incredibly diverse representation in this section of the Webtoon community. There are also a lot of webtoons involving real life and slice of life type stories. The Lady and Her Butler, Let's Play, My Giant Nerd Boyfriend, Murez, Catloaf Adventures. All these are just stories about characters living their normal everyday lives and dealing with problems, situations, and victories as they come up in their lives. They're not the most exciting, but they are definitely a fascinating read and very popular, especially since webtoons, often due to their short chapter length, can publish once a week, if not more often. So it feels like you are living your life alongside the characters' lives. There's also a lot of daily short comics in webtoon spaces, such as Brutally Honest, Midnight Rhapsody, Staying Healthy Together, Meme Girls. These are all done in the scrolling format of webtoons published on webtoon apps, but are officially classified as web comics. The differences between web comics and webtoons are very nuanced, and honestly, there is not a strong line in the sand one can draw. It honestly comes down to what the author considers them to be most of the time. Now, pretty much all of the webtoons that I've listed off for you in my various examples are webtoons that I've read. I may not have completely finished them, but these are all webtoons that I have read at least the first three to seven chapters of, if not the entire series. I do try to support the authors by buying English publications of collected chapter volumes if they are available. However, I am not currently able to pay for paid chapter releases. Therefore, most of my reading is done in series that have the wait time model or on apps where you can earn coins by reading a certain amount of stories each week on certain days that I can then spend towards my paid stories. One of the best parts, though, about this pay by episode or wait time model and the way that these apps run is it means that the creators do see some of your support. It means that you can read these books and you don't necessarily have to pay a lot of money for them, but you can still support the people who are making them. There is one addendum, though, to buying published versions of web comics that are in paper. Because of the scrolling format of webcomics, they're typically meant to be viewed in one long extended line. Now this means that when they're published into book format, they have to be cut in certain places. And sometimes that means that certain images will have to be sized down, so they might just take up the middle center of the page and leave white space on either side, or they might have to be cut right in the middle and carried over to the next page if that's not possible. This means that often reading the book publications can be a slightly different experience, and in fact it can be a worse experience than reading them on your phone. The fact that they are formatted specifically for phone reading means that it is very, very intuitive to read them on your phone through all the various apps that are available to you. Most of the apps that I have mentioned and the websites allow for you to link up your Google account and keep a record of what you're reading and where you're at. Many of them even allow you to download chapters for offline viewing. Webtoons are an up and coming industry, especially in the Western world. They're well established in many Asian markets. They're, in, they're incredibly popular in Korea and China. They've started to break into Japanese publication markets. And in many other places on that side of the world, they are a large part of the market share. Here in the US, they are a growing industry, much like manga is still. This does not mean that they're any less literature than Pride and Prejudice or any other novel, graphic novel, comic, or manga that you could read. They're merely a different form. I would love to hear in the comments if any of you read webtoons, 
if you've decided that you're going to go check out some of these apps, if you feel like you might want to read some of the webtoons that I have recommended or that I have mentioned in this video. I would love to hear if you've already read some of these, if you have similar or opposing opinions. With that being said, I would appreciate it greatly if you would like, comment, and subscribe, take a look at our other videos, and take a look at some of the other videos I've made for the channel.